Hello and welcome. This is Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans, September 29th, and this is the level one presentation, and it is going to be all about this area of the body. You know, when I speak and I gesture all the time, I'm always pointing to up here. We can call it all sorts of different things. We can call it the brow chakra, and chakra just meaning spinning wheel of energy. It can be called the eye of insight, your inner eye. It can be called your third eye, because of course you have the physical one, two physical eyes, but then this is the third eye that represents the addition of a higher dimensional perspective, and I'll get all into what that is. And it can also be called Christ consciousness. Now this is a tough, tough term, tough, like we're, I'm looking for what are, I like that also genius saying first eye, uh, what, what is an appropriate word package that I can use in order to put this concept into? Because I recognize, you know, the more that I share ideas in this cultural context and from feedback that I get from people, some people when I say Christ consciousness are misinterpreting what I'm talking about. So let me clarify from the beginning, like it would probably be easier if we could call it something like one, two, three, four consciousness, and then it wouldn't have the connotation of a particular earth surface religion. So hey, I mean, I hear, look, I got a little cross, I wear a little cross, I am not affiliated with any Christian church or a literal interpretation of the Bible or the Torah or any scrolls or anything like that, that I had an experience in the journey of walking into this body of connecting directly with Christ consciousness. And so that's where I'm coming from when I share all of this. And also I encourage everyone, if you can, check out the recorded lessons that I have on this because the, the one that is about non-religious Christ consciousness, it's really extensive and I'm going to recreate it as much as I can. But of course, this experience, me talking on the camera is a little bit different. It's like if you had to take a class and there's the actual textbook, you read the textbook and then you come into class and you have the professor give the lecture, but that is not the same as reading the textbook. So I do a lot with diagrams and with using images and pictures in the recorded lessons that I think are really descriptive and I do it in a way that makes sense because sometimes I recognize when I come on here I always try to do things in a way that is um, very logical and methodical and makes sense and sometimes I jump around so forgive me that I jump around and uh, yeah check out the recorded lessons so this is the idea that this is an aspect of your own anatomy it's and if there's one takeaway from this presentation it's that this is all inclusive it includes consciousness if you are conscious then you are part of christ consciousness or this overarching uh, viewpoint of awareness because this is an this is like i'm not making illuminati signals either and we'll get into secret societies also this is an aperture on your body just like these are apertures places where energy comes into your body so here's what i will do in this presentation i will go through the physical apparatus of what exactly is your pineal gland and what exactly are these energetic structures and then how do they work but the main thing is it's a part of your own body like imagine like your tongue of your mouth this is another magical part of our body hey it allows us to sense the chemical components and molecular components of food to, to determine whether it's an appropriate substance to actually be swallowed and go into the rest of the body hey it also allows us to speak and use language i mean these are pretty magical things now imagine if there was a secret society that said everybody has a tongue, but not everybody is allowed to use it. So let's only allow certain people to actually use their tongues and other people will, you know, either have it amputated or tied up somehow. And this is kind of what's been going on because we have to recognize we're on a traumatized planet. So what should be here, this little picture over here, what should be all oh, human anatomy and all these perfectly structured, nice, healthy energy centers. This is like the most idealized, you know, beautiful and anatomical form that it's possible to have. But what we actually have on our planet is a degradation and it, it involves the energy centers at many different levels. So it involves uh, insight up here and it also involves uh, yellow, our, our aspect of daily waking conscious intellect. So first, okay, blah, blah, blah. Let me get up some pictures, 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 pictures. And I know I make squinty scrolly faces. Okay, good. I was a little bit concerned. I did the software update and then now things aren't working quite right, but it, all the pictures are still here. So, uh, okay, let's do first. Here's, here's this one, this one, and this one. And we'll do this one too. And we'll do this one too. I'm doing lots of pictures. Okay, so this is from the etching that I usually have back behind me on my little, and let me get the pencil so I can do some drawing over here. So what I'm highlighting over here, this 
place, there's an intersection, and I'll erase what I drew so you can actually see it. There's an intersection of these two spinning wheels of energy that are known as chakras, and they come together at a particular place inside of your brain. So now I'm making a distinction between two different things that are in you. You have your non-physical energy centers, this orange, this yellow, all of these, these are like magnetic fields. If you look at a magnetic field, you don't see it with your physical eyes, but it is there, it has a presence. So all of these things, this is your time body, it's your energy body, it's your light body, it's made of pure ideas and possibilities and probabilities, and it's non-physical. And then of course you can see the white outline of the person in there, that's the actual physical body. So your these energy centers, this is made of whirling and swirling energy. It is not something that once you die or your energy centers leave your body still exists. It's like if we have to contrast, like if this is your head, your face well, with a nose sticking out like that, very rudimentary face, and this is your brain inside of your skull, you know, at the end of your life, we can cut open your brain and look inside and see, oh, look, there's these little structures in there. There's these little neurons, there's these little glands, and those exist even after consciousness or the energy presence has left your body. However, all of these, what I'm pointing to over here, those will not be there after death. So you have the actual physical apparatus that is part of your physical structure of your brain that's called your pineal gland. And there's all sorts of secret teachings about it that are now no longer secret. And that is what actually emanates this um, reality creation mechanism. Here, let me go back to my face. Oh, I should, I'm gonna show you lots of other pictures, don't worry. Um, yeah, uh, this is um, information that is so highly regarded by these secret societies because this is your reality creation mechanism and learning about it can change your life profoundly and empower you profoundly. This is the only reason why this information has been kept secret in any way. And it's the only reason why there would be any impediment to me or any other teacher sharing it with you. It's kind of like, don't give them the recipe. Don't let them actually make the strudel, like make them figure it out. If someone actually gives you the recipe, then it's easy to make the strudel. So that's what this is about. But I'm telling you, this is a birthright. It's something that we were all given the potential with at birth. However, not everybody has been allowed to effectively cultivate and express that inner potential. So it is the potential to be able to see across time. So now let me just do a little drawing and give you the idea. If you can see across time, what it would look like, let's say this is a big giant table. And let's say I took the film strip of your life. You know, like, I, I don't know if anybody even understands this anymore. This is an old fashioned movie. And the movie is made of individual frames rolled up on a film strip, right? So here's the beginning of the movie that I'm highlighting in red over here, and I'll change the color. And then all the way, you know, at the end of the movie, that would be the end of the movie reel over there. So this, let's say that this table that I just drew is what would happen if we cut up all of those frames of the movie off of the film strip and laid it all out on a big giant table. Here, I'm just it's extensively drawing this perfect grid. Here's birth that I just highlighted in blue. And then here's the end of your movie, your last final moment where you, like a bug, splat on the windshield of the membrane of death and you're stuck there. Um, and that of course, it's this whole journey going through every single moment of life that represents who you are you know, up to that culmination point. So this perspective, looking at time in this way would be considered the higher dimensional or multi-dimensional perspective as opposed to you know if you're in the audience and you're watching one frame at a time on the film strip one moment at a time we're like that we have been like that for a very long time it's disempowering and it makes it very difficult to effectively navigate but other things happen too when we are able to perceive the totality like this so in order to perceive the totality like this what you first need to do is get the multidimensional perspective. So I often use the um, analogy that you're like a little two-dimensional insect or like a little caterpillar that's walking on the flat surface of time and that the way that you get perspective is by jumping off the surface. And that's exactly what happens when we have achieved this viewpoint, we've jumped off the surface of time and we're able to see, hey, this event over here, this birth over here ends up culminating in this death over here. And all of this journey, all this rigmarole is like the cause and effect. So first of all, and now I'll go to more pictures for you. It takes love in order to do all of this. 
Love is literally, it is the gas that quote unquote makes my car go, my higher dimensional car. So now I'll get to more of those pictures that I said, oh, I was going to show you those pictures. Hold on a second. So this is, uh, this is, choose the right color this time, green. So, and I hope you can see, I'm making a little pen mark down here, good. This, these big giant energy centers in green, that represents the emanations of the heart. And I can't quite get my pen down there, but they emanate from that little dot that is kind of right there in the center of the chest. And this is just literally, just like a magnetic energy center, magnetic field that is created by the whirling vortex motion of your heart. And I've said many times that love is not just an airy, fairy, hippie ideal. It's an actual tone that we make when we go through time at the right moment. So we are supposed to move through time one moment per moment. Like if this is a moment and this is a moment and this is a moment, we're supposed to transfer our consciousness at exactly the right rate. It's like musicians playing on the beat. That's what we're supposed to do. And when we play on the beat, we don't have inner mental friction. Inner mental friction is evidenced by verbalized thought. And so every time you think of verbalized thought, like I am hungry, pass the potatoes, that is evidence of friction. And so when we achieve a blissful mind, and the blissful mind is not the idiot lobotomized blissful mind, it is the blissful mind of an expert or a master that moves through time at exactly the right rate and doesn't cling to the past or stretch forward to the future, we create love, we create this beautiful, love tone. Oh, I'm making a love tone, I'm making a love tone. So this is, we do this through meditation and mindfulness and bring that tone into our daily waking consciousness. And so that's just the baseline. I know for many people and for many religions or for, for, for mm, my word's not working, for, philosoph, philosophies, approaches, schools of thought. The idea is that that's the peak, the culmination of what we're supposed to do, just become a loving being. But to my understanding, that is like the foundation. That's like the baseline. I'm trying to draw like the base of a pyramid, the baseline, literally, that this whirling vortex of energy is like the cushion or the chair upon which all of this other stuff, now I'm changing colors properly, all of this other stuff sits on top of it. So what we have over here is that's that pineal gland in the center of the brain. These two wheels that you see over here, this is part of the indigo or brow chakra. And there's one in front of the face. I don't know if you can see it, but it's like a lens in front of the face. And this represents the anthropomorphic viewpoint. I use this all the time. I use this term all the time, human centered viewpoint. And the human centered viewpoint at this moment is distorted. Like imagine if you're looking through a lens, but instead of it being a perfect lens, imagine it's got a pebbly front, kind of like, you know, I with astigmatism. It's distorting our view of the world. And this is what we have been experiencing for a very long time due to the genetic squashing and due to the destruction of the healthy functioning of this area of our body. So ideally, we are supposed to have this as a functional inner eye or eye of higher insight that allows us to see through time. If we could, we would make no mistakes. It's like being able to read the musical score of the cosmos. Here, here's my little piano back here. This is the first note. This is the second note. And then what's going to be the third note? I don't know, Aurora, because I can't read music. But if I could read the score of time, I would know that's the next note. And then when all the musicians play together... It sounds like beautiful music. So that's the whole point. By degrading the human higher faculties, it has made humans make music. Cover your ears. It sounds more like this. We don't know what the heck we're doing. Mostly humans don't know what the heck is the next note to play. Not your fault because you don't have the higher faculties activated. So first creating that cushion or foundation of unconditional love. And unconditional love also means that we have achieved the emotional stance to accept what we see when we actually use this higher faculty and look down the time tunnels. Like if this is a time tunnel and I'm starting to look down there, if I see something, I have to accept it. I can't be in denial. What it means to be in denial is like saying, information, factual data has come to me. I'm not listening to it, you know? And that could be like, if you don't change the steering wheel of your life, you're going to hit the membrane of death. And if you don't choose to listen to that information, then it's like, okay, you will hit the membrane of death. And people do this all the time. Like it might be your higher eye of insight is looking down the time tunnel and telling you, hey, if you keep on eating blah, blah food, you're gonna get this disease. And people keep on doing it and they get that disease or keep on smoking blah, blah tobacco or keep on doing blah, blah health habit. Or if you don't change and do this, then this will be the end result. Or it could even be in a job 
we're in a relationship. Like you can see down the time tunnel, hey, if I don't change my job, this is what's going to happen. Or if I don't get out of this relationship, this is what's going to happen. And instead of honoring that, many people throw that information out the window because it is not convenient to their present life trajectory. And then they end up smashing like a bug on the windshield. So none, none of that is the appropriate response. But I also want to talk a little, so that's, we're talking about seeing on the anthropomorphic level. That's the narrative structure of humanity. It's like watching a movie that has a narration and has a story. Your life has a storyline. So-and-so was born on this day and lived in this place and then moved here and then died. That's a story, but there's another way of looking at it, which is abstract, which is like saying, I draw this little time vortex and we say, here's a way, let me just change to a different color that you can see better. So-and-so was born down here on this date and traveled through the time vortex this much until boom, they hit the membrane of death and that's what they experienced. That is seeing from the higher dimensional perspective. And there's different levels of interpretation and distortion when we see through the anthropomorphic level. So since I just switched over to, to purple, let me now highlight this over here. This is the librarian of the cosmos. This is the higher dimensional guidance center that literally connects each one of us to information that is uh, more structured. When I say higher, it's like this note over here. Can you hear that? That's the highest note on my piano. It's higher, it's not better. It's just higher in tone or higher in frequency than here. Let me knock, not knock things over. This, this note down here, that's not a worse note. It's just a lower note. So this purple energy center or chakra of the body is known as the crown. And it is where we literally plug into the higher dimensional, more organized sense of intelligence of the cosmos. And if people have trouble with my choice of vocabulary word, if I call it the source, like, no, I'm not, I'm not being co-opted by the CIA. I promise you, I'm not part of an Illuminati secret society. I am actually here trying to give empowering information so that we each can take control of and express positively through our manifestation, creation, apparatus, mechanisms, that that is what this is. This is literally your higher faculties for creating reality. This is how you make things happen in the world. And mostly that would be considered to be a magical Magical activity, like involving a magic wand. I'm holding up my little pencil. I wave my magic wand and poof, I make things happen. That's like a fairy tale, what most people consider to be just a fantasy. This is not, this is not a fantasy. This is very real reality. We each have this inner capacity to create reality. However, it's been distorted and degraded and hijacked. So we are right now in the process of reclaiming it. We're healing it and we're reclaiming it. So, okay, let me, wait, clear, let me clear all this stuff out. Let me go on to the next picture that I wanted to show you. I'm trying to make it, there we go. Okay, let me now clear, erase that thing. Boom. Okay, this picture is important because, let me get a pencil and make it show. Here you can see that center of the physical anatomy where these two energy centers meet and converge. And I hope you can also see, we've got that four vortex shape. I'm just super exaggerating it and then I'll erase it. Four vortex shape, right? And then I hope you can also see these little, these are little people. These are little people that are all converging on that central convergence point because this energy center of your body is a transceiver. It's not just an eyeball, like our eyeballs receive light, but I don't necessarily shoot light beams out of my eyes. In this higher insight, this eyeball of higher insight, it is both a receiver with energy going into this mechanism or apparatus. You're not a computer, I'm not saying you are. It is also an emanator or an emanatrix that you send out energy from this energy center to the rest of the world. And so this is, again, part of the partnership, part of the reality creation mechanism, and it has to do with connecting with other people. And then we get into interdimensional ethics, ethics of time, ethics of boundaries, uh, of the mind, and also of personal identity. Because you start to understand, like, if, if th this person has one eye here and another eye here, and those, those are their physical eyes, and that creates their, view their viewpoint as an individual. Yes, Patricia is saying ethics of law of consent. That is exactly right. Um, th this person, you know, with the face over here has one particular viewpoint. But then in their mind, their mind can be comprised of the composite viewpoint of this guy and this woman and this person and this person, this person, this person, this person, and many, many others that I haven't actually drawn. This is just a very rough sketch. That your inner viewpoint can be comprised of many, many different consciousness partners 
And it's gotta be all consensual. It's gotta be all based only upon unconditional love. We are a telepathic society, and I say this all the time, you're not just swimming around in your own private kiddie pool. That would be like, you know, you over here, you are connected to an ocean of consciousness. Here's all of these other people that you are connected to, that you, what you send out on your thought streams can uh, connect to other people, and then what they send back to you connects to you, and we are all, uh, these are musicians in a symphony, we are all learning to play together. So again, what I've drawn here, this is like a, a level of idealized reality. Get it? I mean, like if, if you're getting to know me, I clearly have a utopian vision, and that's what I tend to express in my artwork. I'm always drawing everything as perfectly as I possibly can. So that's the idea of what this is expressing, that when we have a perfectly healthy and well-tuned body, that this is the functioning of this energy center. So I know there's some people that might be fans of the show Sense8, and that's a good show. You know, we've got some violence and some other stuff I don't really like that much, but I do appreciate the idea that it's seeding the meme into people's minds of composite consciousness that one individual, this person has this face down here, can have a little facet from this person, maybe a talent or skill or insight from this person, or a talent or skill from this person, or from this person, or from this person, and that they all add up together in order to enrich this meta personality. And that's what each one of us is supposed to be doing. Like if this is you, I'm this little individual person down here, what you are is like one little tiny cell connected to many, 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 many other cells. And this creates this network of consciousness. And each one of these cells has an expertise you know, in the sense eight show, one person is a Kung Fu master, or, you know, one person is uh, an assassin, or one person knows something else that everybody draws upon different skills in order to help other people out of, out of a jam in whatever is your, that not, my words aren't even working properly, but you're understanding what I'm talking about. This can be a very wonderful partnership of consciousness like musicians working together but now what it's like what happens if those musicians aren't loving so all of this is supposed to be done only through love that each one of these people is connected through these um, harmonic bridges of love and that's the only way it happens however technology as I've described in the past is a distortion technique and a compensatory mode that now is allowing some people who have not earned the right to be able to connect telepathically, to connect telepathically. There are musicians who aren't good musicians. Cover your ears, because they're playing music like this. And they're loud, and they're bad, and I don't really appreciate them in the symphony at all. Let me switch to another picture. Okay, so here's another simplified picture where you can really see, just changing colors here, this horizontally oriented brow chakra and this vertically oriented crown chakra. And these are exactly like, oops, these are exactly like, here, this is a helicopter. We've got the blades that go around the top of the helicopter. And here's the helicopter's simplified body. This pen is not that fancy. And here's the rotors in the back. And they're at 90 degree angles. And what that does is stabilizes the helicopter as it flies through the atmosphere. And what these non-physical energy centers do, oops, when they are, when these guys are spinning at exactly the right rate, like, you know, this guy's spinning around like this, this guy's spinning around like this, they stabilize your flight through time, that this is you flying on a particular timeline. Oh, wait, maybe that's not a good timeline. Maybe you don't want to be on that timeline. Well, then let's turn your gaze, and now you'll fly down this pathway over here. And so the idea is that it is this higher guidance principle, this crown chakra. And again, this is not like an extraterrestrial overlord or something that owns you or something malevolent. I understand we're on a traumatized planet. I'm speaking through that filter of understanding of people who have been really horribly traumatized. I'm right, really um, understanding and fighting for freedom alongside of each one of you, of each one of us. I'd like to say we're like little baby sea turtles we have hatched out of the eggs. We're trying to scramble across the beach and make it to the ocean of consciousness. We are all vulnerable to the seagulls and other things that want to eat us. So this is like saying we understand that in this bid for freedom of consciousness, like to return to our own divinity or reawaken our own divinity, that there are all these imposters that have tried to lead us astray. However, I am not an imposter. I'm not trying to lead you astray. And the whole idea is that we connect 
to this own aspect. It's really of your own energetic anatomy. And that tells you which pathway you want to be going down or what thing you want to be looking at. Should you be looking at this pathway down here? Not if it ends in death. Should you be looking at this pathway down here? Again, only if it leads you towards eternal uh, existence, towards continued existence. So, okay, now let me just see if I have any more cool pictures to show you. Yes, this one is even more um, complex and uh, accurate. And so it's this over here. And what you can really see on this painting and in this drawing is the idea of each one of these layers of, of reality or energy centers of the body is like uh, a layer of time. Like we have the first layer that's down here. And then as we move backwards in time, we get to this layer and then move a little bit further backwards. Like we're, we're looking down a time tunnel, just like you can look down a road. Here, let me draw this like this. This is uh, like I'm in art school. Pretend I'm in art school. I've just, that's my canvas. Here's the horizon line. And here I'm, I'm learning to paint, I'm drawing a road. The road goes off like that, and here's the sun, and here's some mountains in the distance. So just like we understand here where the road is fatter, it's closer to us, and then here where it's skinnier, it's further away, this is the same type of time road over here where we're looking at the physical world and the emotional world and the intellectual world as being quote unquote closer to us. And this stuff that's over here and on backwards as being further away from us in time that that is, um, here, clear all this out, that that we're looking at the time body and we're looking at layers of time. So those are the purple layers are like the ones that are the closest to that beginning time source here. And that one I already showed you. Okay, but hold, let me just drink a little bit of water and then I'll get into the exact physical anatomy. Like I just showed you a lot of non-physical anatomy. All of that stuff, is like the projection in a movie theater. You know, the projection, the light that actually goes on the screen is intangible. We can't just like capture it in a jar. It, it goes off when we turn off the projector. And that's what I'm trying to say, that this reality is a projection of our consciousness and it is intangible and we are experiencing it nonetheless. The movie projector is the actual pineal gland. Yes, this has been secret information for a very long time. It's not secret anymore. Let's get into exactly what your pineal gland is shaped like. So, okay, let, first let me draw your physical eyeball. Here's your physical eyeball. This is your iris, and this is your pupil, and you, know, you got kind of a lens in front of your eye. And then back here, this is your retina. And your retina is covered in lots and lots and lots of little sensory cells that are very sensitive. And here's your focal point. And all of this information, it's light information that is caught and turned into a neurological signal that goes down your optic nerve back here to your brain. Here's brain. All right. Your pineal gland is startlingly similar in structure to your physical eyeball. And it is actually an uh, um, evolutionary vestigial trace from our reptilian heritage because reptiles have this little light sensor that is this little gland on the top of their head and it um, governs uh, waking and sleeping cycles or the circadian rhythm. So basically this is your pineal gland and it has everything to do with sensing light. Except, wait, 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 wait this light sensing organ lives deep within our brain. Like this makes sense. These are our light sensing organs that are right on the front of our face where there's access to plenty of light. Why would we have a light sensing organ buried deep within our brain, far away from any light? And the answer is because these light sensing organs are stimulated by thought. So this is, I just drew your pineal gland there. This is a nerve that goes in one direction, nerve that goes in another direction. This is like the little retina, very similar to this retina that I just drew over here. And it has lots of tiny little receptor cells on it, but this eyeball does not have an opening here. There's no way for light to get inside of there. So now I'm choosing a, let's make purple the color of thought. Thoughts come into here and stimulate these little tiny signals. That, sorry, they are signals that stimulate these little tiny sensors. And then those little tiny sensors turn it into a signal and they send it back on here and they send it to your brain. This is literally your imagination. This is where, what you use to envision, to look at or think about something that's not in your physical presence. So if I said to everyone right now, hey, I want you to imagine a purple banana, then this is the place in your mind, in your physical structures of your biology where you would imagine 
and envision like a movie projecting the purple banana. So now that you've created the inner image of purple banana, I know you're all imagining one right now. It's going down these neural pathways to the optical centers of your brain. And now you're having an actual image of a purple banana. And let's say that you really, really, really put lots of imagination and creative energy into it, now we can send those waves of consciousness out to other people. And here, wait, 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 here's a little guy over here. He's got an activated pineal gland. And all of a sudden he gets one of these little broadcasts from you. And in his mind, he begins to envision a purple banana. So this is basically telepathy and it is done on a bridge of love. Love is the gas that makes the car go. You're not supposed to be able to make this kind of conversation unless you love the other person. This guy imagining the purple banana over here must be connected on a bridge of love to this guy who's receiving over here. These are like the energetic firewalls, the way that the cosmos has been set up in order to prevent people from hurting each other with these higher faculties. So, however, there is, of course, the users of technology. There are, of course, the users of technology who have created artificial mechanisms. Let's make them like orange or like here, here red. The, make artificial mechanisms that hijack this and make it possible to send out emanations that are um, augmented is a good word. I, I joke, I, I, it's like breast implants. Not that I'm casting aspersions on anyone who has reconstructive surgery or anything like that, but there's a difference between being born well endowed in the breast department and getting implants, you know, for, for cosmetic procedures. So I joke, I call these, you know, these technological pineal, Im, they're, they're implants, they're like fake boobs. And they allow some people to augment artificially their mental emanations and send out things. And this has been going on for a very long amount of time. This is part of the dark magic or hijacking of the time field, hijacking of the natural higher faculties, hijacking of human healthy functioning DNA. So no, go back to my face, drink some water. This is what I talk about when I say that on our entire planet, our entire planet has a chakra system. Our, just like this lady over here has a chakra system. Our planet is like a lady who has a chakra system. And just like each one of us can have a disturbance at this level of insight or being able to see clearly, our entire planet has a disturbance at the level of being able to see clearly. And this is what this is, these genetic invaders that have harmed the anthropomorphic system of interpretation. So this is what is going on. When people begin to self-cultivate and raise their energy, and you're raising your energy because it's at that lower level, and lower doesn't mean worse, but people think it's worse because people are engaged in so much difficulty right now. Um, as the energy begins to raise up the spine and begin to hit up here, it's like energy going through a garden hose. Like first that water is over here at the faucet, then it moves over here, then it's almost at the spout. It's almost, the spout would be like over here. It's almost at the spout, but it's not quite there yet. And so when the energy has just gotten to this level, but humans have not effectively connected to, I would say the divine, I call it the source, but then some people have got problems with that. The central convergence point, where's my sculpture? The central convergence point of this, the emanation of all consciousness, the place where life force energy comes from. They haven't yet connected to that because that's the guiding principle that's supposed to tell you what to look at and how to understand and interpret what you are looking at. Then people are very vulnerable. And this is what's been going on for a very long time, the hijacking of this insight. So once again, insight is not malevolent or wrong in any way. You shouldn't try to uh, solve your problems by blinding yourself. Like, I'll just take out my, my, if you have nearsightedness, yes, you can solve it by taking out your eyeballs and going completely blind. That's not an effective solution. I'm not advocating that. So no, none of this chakra removal type of stuff or anything that means that you should no longer have that. You should have it on your body and it should be functional. That this is the whole idea. This is an aspect of anatomy that is your birthright that is meant to be functional. And it is not associated with any religion. You do not have to be a Christian in order to activate this on your body. So these secret societies, they're not good musicians. They're like people that have learned a couple of little riffs. They're like, oh, I learned to put these notes together and these notes work, but we're gonna keep it a secret. We're gonna use our ability to make music to oppress everyone else. We're not gonna let anyone else make their own music. So I want you to be not unduly impressed with the functioning of these secret societies. They're like the people that have you know, the fake augmented boobies. 
they've got fake augmented technical capacities of their telepathy. They don't come by it naturally. So they do it through, uh, you know, rituals. They do it through the use of technology, what would be considered magic, you know, literally getting together with the right wood and a magic wand, you make all these different things, like make a recipe, make it happen. But it is not a metacognitive understanding of how all these things fit together. It's like if someone gave you the recipe for strudel, but only that, like you don't know anything else about cooking. It's just, but if you follow that recipe perfectly, then you can make strudel. That is what these secret societies are like, and they guard their recipes, of course, as proprietary secrets. They don't want anyone else to be able to make any kind of strudel or any kind of bread. Well, guess what? We're all supposed to be able to do this. We're all supposed to be expert artisan bakers that can do whatever we need to do with our minds. And this is the most threatening thing you could possibly do to the current malevolent superstructure, like the uh, e economic, banking, religious, social, and even what is harming the biosphere. If you want to say F you to all of that, the most profound thing you can do is get your manifestation machinery functional again. Reclaim your apparatus that is about making reality happen. How do you make reality happen? It begins with envisioning up here and then manifesting using manifest manifestation technology. Um, mm -mm. Manifesting using techniques of manifestation that do not require technology. That your body, your birthday suit is the only thing that you need in order to make reality happen. That's really, really different than what is taught by our society and by objective materialism and by the mental viewpoint that is promoted by these secret societies that wish to disempower you, that wish to essentially say, your mind is not powerful enough to effectively control and direct reality. However, we all know your mind is powerful. It is your, your paintbrush that you use. Okay, so Joelle is asking, how do you know if your third eye is open and functioning? So this is pretty big because I almost take it for granted because mine is open and functioning. And when I say that, when I'm saying, I'm not saying it like a huge egotistical idiot. I'm saying I have a library card. That's like saying I have the, I'm, I'm literate. I know what these language patterns are. Hey, I'm standing in front of a bunch of language patterns. That's what this is. So part of it is becoming literate in this higher dimensional language of color, line, shape, form, movement, texture, and tone. Tone being musical tone, that this is the language. So you begin just like um, understanding regular human language with getting what are the letters. You learn the ABCs. You learn how letters fit together to make words. You learn how words fit together to make paragraphs. Uh, sorry, sentences, sentences have syntax and the sentences fit together to make paragraphs. So that's what these are. These are paragraphs back here in this higher dimensional language that I have learned from activating my inner eye. So the eye of insight, when people start to activate this eye, they might have flashes of insight. They might start to see things that can't, it, receive information that can't necessarily be explained or described otherwise. Like being able to know that guy over there has a kidney disease or that guy over there is you know, gonna get hit by a car tomorrow. That, and some people, when they get those perceptions, they're like, oh, I can't think that. That's a terrible thing to think. I don't wanna make somebody sick by thinking that. You're not making them sick, you're perceiving their music. You can see and sense what their body is doing. So some medical intuitives do this. And, but then the question comes about commodification of a talent, because I have to say to each one of us that this is a sacred aspect of your anatomy, just like your genitals are a sacred aspect of anatomy. And that we do not consider it to be appropriate to sell access to one's genitals. We consider that to be energetically and socially inappropriate for a variety of reasons, because those activities of sexual reproduction and creativity, and I'm gonna get into that in level two, are supposed to be guided by different principles than mere commodity, commodification, like I give you money and you do this for me. So it's the same thing with this insight. This insight is supposed to guide you on your journey through the time field. It's not supposed to be random or arbitrary in any way. It's part of being a good musician. So it's being, being taught by the great teacher, by the great music teacher. And the great music teacher first, first wants to teach you this riff, and then they want to teach you this riff, and then they want to teach you this melody and put it all together into a big, beautiful song. And if you start learning things out of order or in the wrong way, then it's like you are not able to be a good musician. So all of this is intentionally um, using your faculties in a way that's right. So I'm not judging other people, but I would say to, I gotta get rid of that note. I would say to people, if you have this higher talent and it's like someone offers you money, this is like having a telescope. Here, let me just rearrange, let me drink some water. It's like having a telescope. This is your inner telescope 
and it can be a microscope too. We can use it here. I can use this to look at far distant things, far distant physically in location wise, far distant in time. I can look at anything anywhere and not to brag. These are where I get my ideas from. So first I sun gaze, it's eating the sun. I get plenty of love energy. I'm solar powered. And then I use that energy to look through the telescope at whatever I want. So sometimes I want to learn about these types of shapes and patterns. Sometimes I want to learn about how chloroplasts work. Sometimes I want to learn about mitochondria. So if I want to learn about something that's in my own body, I turn the telescope into a microscope and then, ooh, Ooh, I can look at my own body and learn about all these different things. This, it's direct perception. So think about this. If each one of our higher faculties was functioning correctly, we could not only see through time, we could learn anything we would need to without the intermediary of a teacher. Wouldn't need to have a teacher telling you, class, this is what photosynthesis is. This is what this is. You want to learn what photosynthesis is? Go look at a plant. Go connect directly to a plant. You want to learn what a star is? Connect directly to a star you know you can have a direct conversation and that that is very different than having to go through these intermediaries just like having to go through the intermediaries of eating food to get the nourishment that you need this is literally the way that you eat pure light you eat light that is made of consciousness you eat light that is made of of ideas yes patricia is saying gnosis the word gnosis means direct experience here let me drink more water I'm, when i talk and talk and talk i get very thirsty Gnosis means pure experience. And again, it's difficult because if I say, hey guys, check out Gnostic Christianity, there's, there's always going to be someone who's going to say, no, Gnostic Christianity is corrupt. So-and-so is bad and wrong. This is a malevolent system. So instead I will say, hey, like the, the, that was an interesting sect of beings that lived you know, thousands of years ago that explored these ideas of spirituality that had to do with awakening one's own higher faculties and having a direct experience of the divine or of God and that that is a very different experience and level of truth than having someone else tell you and describe to you what God or what divinity is or define your experience for you. So that's really where I'm coming from. I, I tend not to share my own experience or proselytize in any way. Like I'm not trying to convert anyone else, but I'll tell you, I had a real experience that was incontrovertible that did not, it's like not something that I question in any way, but I know that that presence is real and I know that it is loving. So my only cognitive disconnect came when I came into earthly human society and I saw all of these professed you know, meeting places, these churches and people who profess to be part of Christianity, I thought I was connecting with all the people that are retina cells of this larger eyeball. And then I had to learn, I was like, oh, that, that's not what's going on here. I had to learn. And so, yeah, so I'm reclaiming this symbol with the, the real idea is that we are all musicians in this grand symphony and that when we all have this activated, that we connect together and we make these incredible magical experiences. This is to me what Christ consciousness or the return of Christ consciousness is on this planet, that people have been mired in literalism, thinking it's a return of an actual physical man with a beard. I know everybody wants a man with a beard. You want to be like hugged. You want to have a friend who's like, oh, I'm going to hug you. Because how do you get hugged by an abstract presence, right? Because this is what I'm talking about. If you're a little mosaic cell of a much larger eye, then it's like you're being hugged by yourself. And for a lot of people, they can't deal with that. But this is, and it's also, it's, I think it's a profound truth. I think it's very loving and comforting to know that it's us on a grander scale. And it's also empowering. It means that we all need to take responsibility for what we emanate with our own reality creation mechanism. And it doesn't cost any money. Literally, it doesn't cost me any money to emanate with my imagination, the concept or the belief or the wish that you guys all are happy and abundant. And I truly wish it for you. And it doesn't cost anything. There's lots of people that I'm connected to on my Facebook. I wish and imagine and emanate for them the best lives that they can have, that they live in the best place. This is what Patricia is saying. We are the embodiment of the return of Christ consciousness. That is exactly right. We are it. We are all, uh, it, oh, okay. Uh, and Jeannie is saying, um, I'll, I'll get into flying rainbow lasagna and how that relates to Christ consciousness. And I'm sorry, I'm having problems with the chat. That's why I'm doing this as, on, on the fly as we go. Um, that we are all part of this connected network and that we support one another just like the cells of my body support each other in my body. And my heart cell is like, I'm so happy to pump the blood to all the other cells and all the other cells are like, 
thank you, heart, for giving us this beautiful energy. Let's give energy back to you too. So this is, I mean, like not to, again, look down my nose at humanity, but you know I talk about the barbarian value system, that when I first came here, I was just somewhat appalled. I was surprised and shocked and appalled, like, oh, clutch my pearls, you know, at the barbarian value system, which is basically like, no, no, I ain't going to help you out. Like, you, you want food? You got to pay for it. You want a place to stay? You got to pay for it. Like, the, the idea that no one's going to just help people out just for the sake of helping people out. Like, to me, that was unfathomable because it's like saying my, my skin cell is saying, like, I ain't going to help you out, eyeball cell. You're the eyeball. I'm the skin. We, we don't work together. It's like, you're part of the same body. You kind of need to work together. So this, this, that was, that's the barbarian value system. It is just incredibly self-centered and it is cut off from the rest of the connected network because even a barbarian at a certain point finds a task that is too difficult for them to accomplish on their own and they will need to employ other people. And then the question is, how do you get other people to work for you if you have treated them horribly, raped and stolen and killed them and killed their family members? How do you be like, hey, get, help, help me build this bridge over here. We got to build a big thing. Help me do it. Like that doesn't work that way. So I understand on a foundation level that you literally get more and help yourself out more by giving to others forming good relationships, working together, working with other musicians. The music gets better for everyone. I gotta drink more water. The music gets better for everyone than the sense of competition. But in order to be a part of that world, you have to see the totality. You have to see everything instead of just seeing your own epidermis as the um, limitation of what you are responsible for. Because it's not just your epidermis. It's also what you're thinking and what you're emanating. What's in your mind? So each one of us gets to choose what's in our mind. And that might also be a radical assertion in this time and place. There, there are a lot of mental in intruders. And also um, there's this whole energy harvesting system that exists where intrusive, intrusive thoughts come into people's minds in order to intentionally harvest energy. And it can be uh, stories that you read in the media, like a, a news story about some kind of terrorist attack or a celebrity who's got butt implants, you know, um, oh, I, I missed that chat, I'm so sorry. Um, yes, all of these are, are energy harvesting um, uh, programs, just like you can run a computer program that's like, yeah, every time you see the keyword uh, purple potato, do this, run this, make this response. So it's like that. They send, there are uh, tele tele telepathic beings that are using augmented telepathy that send out energy harvesting programs that are like think about this celebrity in their butt or think about this war that these are ways of harvesting energy from you and that one of the best you know screw you attitude things you can do is to say no I'm not going to think about the butt implants of the stupid celebrity no I'm going to think what I want to think with my mind so that's a big part of it becoming a virtuoso of your own mind and not allowing intrusive thoughts to dictate your reality because this is where reality comes from that I am intending to paint a beautiful reality with other beautiful collaborative partners that are also uh, awakening and using well their own inner higher faculties. And again, this doesn't cost money. Anybody can do this, even if, I mean, we all need to have food in order to be sustained and a safe place to live and you know electrons flowing in a wire definitely help but you know what i'm talking about it's not like oh it's going to cost you three hundred dollars to be able to activate your pineal gland today it's not like that it is a more a question of how much willpower do you have how much focus do you have how coherent are you thought are your thoughts how loving is your heart so in this way it's a lot more egalitarian it's like hey you can you run the marathon i don't know did you do the exercises did you run five miles? Did you run 10 miles? Did you do the weightlifting? If you did, then you can do the marathon. And if you didn't, then you can't do the marathon. Now let's imagine a person who never did any weightlifting, never did any training, but is still gonna try to run the marathon. Like maybe they attach an artificial exoskeleton, you know, fake muscles that will make their legs run along and then they can run along and run a marathon. That's what the augmented telepathy is like. So all of that is fake, fake, fake. And it's also, I mean, it's not an effective solution, but there's a whole species of basically satanic technology using extraterrestrials that do that. However, I will tell you that our real muscles, I use, I have real muscles. I have real telepathy. I'm not augmented. I use real natural telepathy. It's way more than uh, anything that can be created through technology because it also involves levels of creativity, of improvisation. You know, like I love John Coltrane. I talk about him all the time. He's a jazz musician from the 50s and 60s. 
and he was an excellent improviser. You know, he had a lot of songs that he knew in his song catalog, in his body and in his fingertips, but sometimes he would just go and do his thing and innovate new things. These are things that we can do with our reality creation, telepathy and manifestation apparatus that cannot effectively be done by people that are using clank clank metal exoskeletons. Let me check the time and see how much more time I've got on this recording. Okay, I'm pretty good. I got a, a few more minutes and I know that there's got to be questions, but I, again, I can't effectively access the chat. So the, the idea is that each one of us, so it's through self-cultivation, cultivate enough energy that is at the level of the heart that creates this whirling energy, oh, spinning vortex. And then what you're able to do is use the apparatus of your mind to look around. Use the higher apparatus of your true mind is what I should say. Not your daily waking intellect, not your chattering verbalized quote unquote monkey mind, not the implanted hacked human operating system. Your true mind, that is your nonverbal blissful mind. So you need love to activate it. But then if you are properly guided by this higher dimensional librarian, you will get more love because what you'll do is you'll get insight into why things are the way they are. So now let me get into, oops, this is what I want to do, whiteboard. You know, I drew before that picture of the time plane. This is the higher dimensional viewpoint with all of the grid, like the uh, moments of your life have been laid out like a grid that we can see all at once. And here's a birth over here, remember? And I also drew this little red spot over here as your death over here. So when you, you know, you've achieved this higher dimensional viewpoint, it's like jumping off the surface of time and we're now hovering up above this time plane and we're looking at the totality of the life path. And when we do that, we're using our insight. This is getting beyond duality because you start to see how, wait a minute, this event that happened over here is connected to this result that happened over here. It's almost like seeing embroidery on a tapestry, that you see the threads of events that connect these two things. And that this is the true um, um, uh, value of insight. It's not just being able, like if I could read a book, if I could read someone like a book, I'd know all your secrets. First of all, this is like major blackmail stuff. That's not what your insight is supposed to be used for. You're not supposed to just look into people's, you know, deep, dark, dusty corners of their uh, experience of life and be like, oh, look, you did this illegal thing. Oh, look, yeah, I could get you for this. I can blackmail you for this. That's not what it's meant to be used for. It's meant to be used for greater understanding of why things happen because that gives you more love and compassion and understanding of people. So we can say this event over here happened and then it connected to this event over here. And then I have more of a perspective and more of an understanding. And it's not just within one lifetime. That's one lifetime, one time plane that I just drew. Hey, here's another time plane. Oh, that's that, wait, let me draw a better one. Here's another time plane, a completely different lifetime, a completely different series of events that this, we could call it a soul or a consciousness, an overarching aspect of consciousness is connected to these two lives. And let's say that this event that's over here on this layer of fabric is also connected to this event over here. Oh, hey, wait, let's draw a far distant lifetime here. Maybe this might be a million years ago. This lifetime over here with all of its events, when I see with my eye of insight, look, this thread also connects to this event over here. So when we start to see it with this higher dimensional perspective, it goes beyond the levels of anthropomorphic interpretation because it goes beyond um, one single lifetime. And we're starting to understand not only the layers of time within one lifetime that create results and character traits and behaviors and emotional experiences, but we also see the connection of all of these other lifetimes that also add up. So this is why I say we should not commodify our insight because um, someone might not necessarily pay you to have this viewpoint. Let's say someone's like, oh, I got a, pa I, I got a pain in my back. I'm going to pay you with your, focus your eye of insight on my back and tell me what's, what's hurting me in my back. And that's like, okay, that's great. But if you're using all of your energy to do that, which could help someone and then give you money so you could pay your electric bill, that's great. But then you don't have that insight, that time on your telescope to look at this. So that's why it's not necessarily uh, desirable. It's like, I'm trying not to be judgmental and cast aspersions and say bad, wrong, naughty. It's not like that. 
It's more like saying, if you sell access to your telescope, somewhat you, you get five minutes of time on the world's best telescope, and you're going to sell it to someone else to look at their aching back, like that'll help you in the short term, but that might not really give you the insight that you need. That is the fuel that will bring you in a better direction. So all of the, I hope that you can start to see I mean, I'm, I feel like, again, I always think I'm going to make this very sensible, logical, linear presentation and then I never do. Um, the recorded lessons, I think, are much more logical in the way that I put this forth. But I'm, I'm hoping that you can see if each one of us really activated these potential dormant faculties, um, we would be able to know the origins of our own disease and what we need to do for our own healing. Like you don't have to be a blind person and pay someone else for a session so that they can focus on your aching back and know why it's there. You know why your back is aching. And also you can be able to effectively turn down which road of time you want to be on so that you don't have an aching back anymore, so that you don't have whatever is your challenge. But then it begins to go way beyond that. Yeah, Joelle is saying she goes with the natural spiral flow. That in, it, it, because this insight, I'm trying to say it's like being a musician. And part of it is knowing what the musical score is. If the first note is A and the second note is C, then what's the third note going to be? Part of it is music theory, but part of it is being able to improvise in the moment, like being a wonderful athlete or a wonderful jazz musician, that all of the practice and preparation prepares you to be able to create something new spontaneously in the moment. What if we all could do that? I mean, we, the, this is the idea. If we stop looking at uh, the potential for an externalized savior to come down here, down here, quote unquote, and help us and fix and improve our lives, our health, our economy, your society, the biosphere, the way that we run our planet. If we actually activate our own higher faculties, then we become able to do this. So this is what I, I am an advocate for. This is what, when I wear this symbol, this is what I am, you know, connecting myself to. So Pusher says, the real help a helper can do is to help somebody activate their own higher faculty. Yes. That is exactly right. And I'll tell you this, I am so happy to share these ideas as widely as possible. Like I need to pay the bills too, like anybody does, but I let people, like let's, let's have access to this information, let's share, because the more people that activate their higher faculties and become empowered and make good music and improve their lives, the more that it helps all of us. That when people have good, stable financial foundations and good, stable health and are feeling happy and positive about their life journey, that that is music that sounds beautiful. Here, beautiful music. Beautiful music, as opposed to that, that horrible music, that's what's going on right now where people are being evicted from their houses and they've got cancer and they've got all sorts of problems because those life events affect us. Because let's say that person that dies of cancer might have had some huge thing that they could do to help you, but they're dead and they can't help you now or someone's evicted. So they're so busy just trying to scramble and find a place to live that they can't do the thing for you that they would have been able to do for you. So literally send out your, your our imaginations are powerful. Our, and the, the people get into these things too. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but they get into these Abraham Hicks vortex groups where they just think, oh, you just have to feel happy and imagine yourself in a vortex and then you'll get a free cruise trip. It's not like that. It's just like, like sometimes music flows, but it's, sometimes it's like, you got to practice first and start small and then, you know, work together and, and make the whole symphony. Like you, you got to learn how to manifest. So that is what it is. I have been um, coming up with this uh, way to articulate it. We are each quantum scientists and your body and your life experience here your little yellow yellow time field this is the laboratory and we are all doing experiments to see how we can improve our life in this laboratory and your body and your matter of your body are what we have in order to um you know effectively do these these experiments oh final thing okay and then i'll get to the end of this level one recording Flying rainbow lasagna, and how does this relate to the reawakening of higher faculties? So there's all sorts of different ways for people to raise enough energy in order to activate these higher faculties and essentially become a part of this network of Christ consciousness. Flying rainbow lasagna is not the only way. Um, I will say it is an effective tool for jumping up and over the genetic blockages that have made humans mostly blind. So what's going on in human society right now is there are some people that are natural um, like musicians of the mind, but what often happens is at birth or in early childhood, they are um, made um, 
deadened, like inert, uh, through usually through sexual abuse, that there's different torments that can be done to a person that has a natural higher faculty and it gets turned off. And then I already mentioned the people that are getting implants, they're getting a technologically augmented minds. Literally, this is going on. I do not advocate for this at all. I think it's horrible. That technology exists. It's existed for a very long time. In terms of, think about what, what a scrying glass would be, a magic mirror. Uh, these things that we think of are magical. They're semi-technological. And these things are also being used now. What's a neural lace? What are some of these substances that some elite people ingest thinking that it will augment their mental powers and make them into super beings. Well, the truth is the way that you get to be a super being or to claim your superpowers is through self-cultivation and through love and through becoming a good musician. Learn the music. That's what this is. You know something? I have a whole online class about this. Learn the music and practice the music. It's really nothing more than that. Your own willpower and your own energy and your own creative life force. I feel when I was preparing for today's presentation, there were so many things that I wanted to remember to be able to say, and I don't know if I have gotten through, you know, all of them. Um, but I think that I hit the high points. And then I would encourage everyone to, you know, access the lesson eight of um, non-religious Christ consciousness of the level one recording. So flying rainbow lasagna is one way to overcome or circumvent or supersede the genetic limitations that were placed in that dimmed down the inner perception, the higher consciousness that allows humanity its rightful birthright of being able to perceive across time. However, there are many different ways to reactivate or reawaken that aspect of anatomy. I mean, it, there's a part of it is environmental toxins and poisons, fluoride and other things. I didn't even get to the point of, uh, we have little tiny crystals that are also inside of your imagination of your pineal gland and that the exposure to fluoride and other chemical contaminants reduces the capacity of those crystals to effectively receive and broadcast. I mean, this is none of this is by accident. All of this is on purpose. And of course, it's really since the 20th century that we have been really exposed to chemical toxin soup everywhere. However, that doesn't mean that everybody in the 1700s had an activated pineal gland. No, 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 not at all, because there's been this de degradation of the entire planetary structure at that level. And there's actual, an actual level of the stratosphere that would be um, analogous to that aspect of anatomy on our physical body. So there's aspects of the planetary structure that have been harmed that need to be healed, it's human social structure and human DNA. It is all integrated together that that healing needs to take place. So, you know, I'm an expert on flying rainbow lasagna. I say, hey, this is the way that I have transcended and superseded these challenges, but it's not the only way. So it's one of the ways. Okay, so I'm having trouble with the chat. Usually I do the Q&A at this point, but because of that, if I try to do that, my whole thing will crash. I'm going to have to say, I'm uh, completing this recording for right now. And um, uh, when the questions come up, I can usually answer them right when I see them. So that's what we will do. So thank you to everyone who's tuned in and then we'll get on to level two. Thank you so much.